for the second lecture by Professor Beth Kaffer, who produces the, uh, the first of two lectures on control theory. Yes. Okay. Welcome, uh, everybody, back. I see that uh, I've scared away some of you. Maybe there's, it's a nicer day today than yesterday, so maybe that's uh, the reason that you are not here, some of you. Uh, so today and tomorrow I will talk about uh, control theory. Um, and uh, this is a very, uh, so this is, I think is a very important, important theory uh, for understanding the brain. So we can uh, think of the brain as a, as a sensory motor machine, right? We get sensors in and we get motor actions out. And, um, and that, that breaks down to, uh, to perception. So we, we get a stimulus in and we have to make, do the pattern recognition. We may want to use a deep neural network to do that kind of process, or so this perception. And then there is action. Right, so we, we, want to, uh, we want to reach for a cup or something or uh, pick up something, and this is a, an action that we have to compute uh, to set up a motor program that, that, uh, that does this. And then, but then <coughs> these two problems are not in isolation. Then there is uh, the perception uh, is, is causing action, so based on what we see, we see a nice piece of food and we pick it up. But there's also that the action causes perception. If I look this way, I see this. If I look this way, I see something else. So depending on the action that I take, I get, get different perception. Right? So there is uh, there's an interplay of this, and much of this stuff is, is learned. And so, for instance, this little child here that is, uh, is engaged in, uh, in, in play, and uh, play is very important in this... Uh, in understanding this whole uh, sensory motor integration, right? So you see something, you give it a push, something happens, uh, you laugh and you, you build it up again, you put the blocks again, and you learn all kinds of things about physics. For instance, if you have a stack of four blocks and you remove the lowest one, the whole thing is going to fall over. Now, isn't that wonderful, right? This is sort of something you learn. You not only learn the physics of the blocks in the outside world, but you also learn what your arms are doing, because in the beginning, your brain is sort of wired to your, to your muscles, and you, your brain doesn't know how it's wired to the muscles. But you can fire these neurons and something will happen, and then, so lo and behold, you do these experiments, which we call play, and out of that play, somehow, we learn a motor program. Okay, uh, so separately, we understand the, 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 the perception and the action to a certain extent. So perception is something like Bayesian statistics, right? We have maybe, or not Bayesian statistics, we have, uh, we have a feed-forward neural network. We have a, like a perceptron that I told you about yesterday. So we pretty much understand that, that and there's a lot of theory about that. A, conceptually, we have a good, quite a good understanding of that. Um, information theory, maximum entropy, all these kind of principles that are very well known and very well studied and they have a solid engineering background and there's a good match between what the brain does and what we know from engineering. Uh, the learning is the parameter estimation, but um, action, uh, what is action? So it could be control theory, uh, so that's what I, what I think. Um, but uh, so, so far, if you, there are different types of control theory, there is the so-called adaptive control theory in which you have a controller which is already basically telling you what to do, but it just have a bunch of parameters that you can adjust, which is, uh, which is the kind of controls that you see in many industrial plants. Uh, that is of limited use to describe a, a control situation that we are facing here with this child. So the, the more richer class of control theory is, is, is called uh, optimal control theory, in which you basically <laughs> model the whole space and, and define the whole uh, problem as, a, as an optimization problem, and this is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, but that is, uh, as we will see, is intractable, meaning that the computation required scales exponentially with the, with the problem size. Uh, and furthermore, this, this optimal control theory has, has funny features like that it has to compute backwards in time, that you have to solve equations uh, in the reverse order of time, which seems to be very counterintuitive for a biological process. Um, and how to represent different uh, control strategies. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, lot of problems there. So, um, so we have some theory about, some idea about how to do control, but actually how to integrate control and, and the perception, so do this whole sensory motor integration, uh, we have actually very, very little ideas. Uh, so the sensing depends on the action, as I just told you in the example. Uh, uh, 
Uh, so how to set up a theory that integrates all these kind of things is, is, very, uh, is very difficult. So also, for instance, the kind of features that you may want to learn for a certain task, for instance, again, this child here, the feature was to learn, in a sense they depend on the perception, so you can look for the, uh, for the things that are most uh, dominant in the, uh, in, in the individual space, and say, I'm going to learn these, these features, but then again, there is also features that may be very pertinent for the kind of control tasks that you're trying to execute, right? And so how do you link these two? How are you going to learn from the individual system the features that you need for the motor system? Uh, there's problems with action hierarchies. So if I, if I learn... Uh, so children, they learn first how to, to crawl and then to walk and then to run. Right? So you use, have a hierarchy of skills, and you use the, the basic skills as, as, uh, as, uh, as ingredients for higher, higher level learning. And in cognitive tasks, we see the same. You, know, you learn some basic mathematics, and then you get, really get an expert at this mathematics, where you keep on combining elementary and elementary things. And we have basically no understanding of a theory how to do this hierarchical learning, where we combine, where we break down a learning task into, uh, into, mot into elementary atomic motor primitives, as they call it, and then how to combine these in a flexible way. So these are all open problems, and I'm not going to tell you the answer to any of these problems here, but I hope to, in these two lectures, to give you a framework of this path integral control theory, which is uh, solving, addressing some of the issues. For one thing, it's addressing the issues how to do learning uh, in these systems, and we'll see that. And uh, it, it will uh, also deal with the intractability uh, issues and uh, with the uncertainty. So most importantly, the uncertainty issue is that um, it will provide... So if you want to do learning in these systems, you have to be able to deal with the uncertainty because your, your learning system, your controller, at the beginning is going to be very bad. And so you have to build a controller which is based on a very uh, bad understanding of the situation. So you have to do a control action which is also adapted to that very uncertain situation. And, and, this, uh, and therefore you need uh, control mechanisms that allow you to deal with uncertainty. And that is what this path and growth methods uh, will be able to, to do, as I hope to show you. So there's also a philosophical uh, bit here, uh, uh, which is my pet theory of, uh, of, uh, of consciousness. Uh, so if you think about it, so the neural activity that we observe that we have in the brain are actually of two types. There are the neural activity that are driven by the sensors. This is your Bayesian processing, right? I see a chair. I have some, some preconceived concept of a chair. I do a, do a sort of a template matching, which is my Bayesian template matching of the sensory data that comes in and what I think is a chair. And if you have to get a better fit with the chair than with the dog, then I say this is a chair, right? So this is, this is one kind of neural activity that is happening in a recurrent neural network in some complex way that uh, Jim DiCarlo knows much, much better to explain than me. Um, that's that part. So there the neural activity depends on the stimulus and the internal model. And, but there is also the internal model that is also uh, responsible to build our actions, right? So we, we run internal simulations. We have an internal model of the world, like I was a child. We all were children before. We all had this world block model. We know what's happened if we remove the lower block. So we have this internal model in our, in our world. It's, it's embedded in, in some neural network structures. In a sense, we have a small world in our, in our head, which is a complete simulation of the world outside there. We know essentially in all the situations that we, that we uh, are engaging in what more or less is going to happen. We have a predictive model of the world outside us uh, in our head. And that predictive model allows us to set up little what-if experiments. What if I would do this? What would happen if I would do that? What would happen? And based on these kind of simulations, we're going to get some, some statistics and we're going to get some good outcomes. We're going to get some bad outcomes. And based on that, we're going to make a plan. And in fact, the story that I'm just telling you, these kind of simulations, is very much what this path integral control uh, is, is going to be doing, as we're going to see tomorrow. So um, there are these two kinds of, uh, of activities. So the, the models that we have in our head, they play two roles. One is a recognition task, where the model is used in a Bayesian sense to say, OK, I'm reading a text. I see a bunch of uh, letters, and I make up, I fill in the rest of the letters by making the whole text because I have preconceived ideas what this text is going to be about. So that is Bayesian perception. But at the same time, this world model also allows us as a simulator to, to generate uh, possible actions, to compute possible actions that we're going to do in the, in the future. So this is, uh, OK, so keep that in mind. Um, yeah, so I'm going to keep this for later. 
Okay, so so let's talk about uh, optimal control theory. What is it? So here, uh, here you see uh, the, the essence of the optimal control theory. There's a big giant, he has a tree, he wants to hit a little guy, and so he has to make a sequence of actions which, which hits him right on the head. And so what the task is, is to find a sequence of actions that minimizes two things. One is the energy, cons the energy consumption of the movement. You want to do it as efficient as possible. And secondly, of course, you want to hit the target. You want, don't want to be next to it, right? So the cost is made up of two things, which is a path cost, which is this total integrated cost, which may be energy or whatever, and, uh, or, or speed, that you want to be as fast as possible. And the second one is to get, get, uh, get to the target. So this is, this, is a, this, is a, uh, this is, in essence, the control computation, given some model of this environment, compute this action, uh, this sequence of actions that gets you to the goal. Now, there, uh, in some environments, there is, is uncertainty, there's noise. And that I, I, I tend to, uh, to explain with this, uh, this small anecdote. So there is this spider who wants, wants to go home. And uh, there's two ways to go home. He can go uh, over the bridge here, here on the left. I made this drawing myself, I'm very proud of it, by the way. So go over the bridge, or he may walk along uh, the, around the lake to go, to go home. So these are the two possible plans that he can make, the two possible actions. Now, if there's no noise in the world, he would just take the simplest and the cheapest and the fastest route, which is go over the bridge and be home, and that's the end of the story. This is the optimal control computation. Now, suppose that the spider has been drinking uh, at night, and he wants to go home. So then, uh, as you may have experienced yourself, then there is a certain uncertainty that if your intention is to go left, there may be so 10% probability to actually go right. And if you do that on this rickety bridge there, uh, there is actually a chance that you're going to fall in the water. So if you do the expectation computation, there is an expected cost of now crossing that bridge, which may be very, very high. And so the, the smart, drunken spider decides to walk around the lake and take this solution. So what is the morale of the story? The morale is that if you add a little bit of uncertainty to your, to your problem, the, quali the, the solution can change quantitatively. So it's little noise to the, to, the, to the problem doesn't mean that you get a little, little bit changed solution. You get to get a drastically different solution. And here the analogy with physics is also very uh, revealing because noise is, of course, temperature, right, or inverse temperature. And so we have a high temperature solution, which is the noisy solution. We have a low temperature solution, which is the non-noisy solution. And we can think of phase transitions, where we have temperature in water. With a high temperature, we have a liquid. and low temperature, we have a solid. And we see that we get two qualitative different solutions in a high and a low phase. And the same you see here, you can imagine that there is a critical amount of noise in which you get the transition from going to over the bridge to going around the lake. Right? So you get this, this phase transition in the, uh, in the solution space. Okay, so that's, uh, that's that. so, and this is important for, for exploration. Uh, so when, when, there is, when you're very uncertain about the environment, when you don't know about the environment, it's very important to have a control of this, uh, of this, of this noisy setting and also for learning, as I mentioned before. So in the control, I, I discern three very hard problems. So one is, is, uh, is, is the motor babbling that the child was doing. Right? It's just sitting in front of a pack of blocks and just figuring out what the physics of the world is. Right? This is like, like little Newton. Right? He is just playing with the blocks and see what happens. That he learns that you cannot put a block on one of the corners of top, top of the other. It's going to fall over. You have to put it on the flat side on top. All these kind of basic physics things. Some things slide, some things don't slide. So make a model of the world. This is, one of the, is, is, is a very complex uh, task. So learning and exploration. And of course, exploration means that you're not going to learn everything, right? I mean, it's, uh, if you, exploring means that you gonna, it, sort of, it says that you're going to look at certain things, but not at all things, because if you're going to be exhaustive, you're going to be dead before you have a, uh, have a sensible model of the world. So you have to make choices, and that's about the exploration. So these are very hard problems. The second is once you have that model of the world, so you know your plans, you know that if you turn this knob, uh, this is going to go up, and so you turn that knob, that is going to go up. Now you're in the business of planning. Now you have to find your optimal plan. So you have, a, you have your certain initial condition, you have your physical model of your plans, and you want to go to a certain end goal. How do you get there? So you make the movement of the, the thing. This is the second problem. This problem is also very hard because it scales exponentially uh, in, the, in the stochastic set set setting, scales exponentially in the in the, domain, in, the, in the dimension of the problem. 
But then there is a third problem. So if you've solved the first two problems, you have the solution, which is your optimal control. It tells you, if I'm in this position, uh, I, have to do this, uh, I have to do this movement. And it is this, this, very, this very small uh, thing, u of x and t. u is the control, some vector, it, 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 it steers all the joints in your system, and x is the state, is the internal state of your body, that you're, the pose that you are in, the, or maybe velocities also. And so this mapping, uh, although it is a very small thing here in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this transparency, can be a massive thing, right? It's very, very, very big. So, it's, it's, uh, so X can be 100-dimensional, uh, and, so and, and U can also be 10 or 100-dimensional, so you have this mapping in very high dimensions, and actually it's not a Gaussian, it's not something simple, it's not a table, it's an infinite-dimensional object, actually. So you have to, how to represent that uh, in the machine is, is a very big problem. So these are the three big problems. We're mainly going to be talking about the second problem, but we're also going to talk a little bit about the third problem, how to solve this with, with neural networks later in the, in, the, in the thing. So this idea of the passing role uh, control is, um, is essentially to express a control computation as an inference computation. I will put words, put formulas to that, what that means. So uh, whereas normally the control problem is a, um, is, is you have to solve some differential equations, here, the approach is that for a certain class of control problems, you can, you can uh, find the, an expression for the solution as a path integral. So, so the optimal control is, and then you get some expression, and then you have to evaluate that. So it's a closed form expression. But it's hard to evaluate the expression, and that expression is evaluated, this expression is this path integral, and it's, it, 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 is, uh, it is evaluated by using some sort of a Monte Carlo sampling approach. Now, then the sampling that you use can be uh, more or less efficient. Um, you're sampling, uh, and, and we're going to, so let me not dwell on that because we're going to come back to that. So we're going to accelerate this uh, sampling by, by, uh, by something called important sampling. And actually, the controls that you compute are uh, proxies for the, for the way you sample. So if you want to go this way and uh, you're, uh, you're sampling this direction, you're not doing very well because your sampling is very inefficient. If you're able to steer your sampling procedure towards the direction you want to go, then you're doing much better. And so there is a sort of a, an agreement between the optimal control that you want to compute to solve your control problem and the optimal control that you use actually in your sampling. So they go hand in hand. So you have a sort of a bootstrapping approach where you get better and better. And now, in order to, to get this good controller, this controller can be learned. And, and so you have some neural network that represent that. So the overall picture is going to be like this, and it's going to be very hand wavy at the moment because we're going to actually come back to this whole theory tomorrow. And I just want to give you a sort of a forecast of it. So you have, you get some samples which give you the data, and then you learn a controller, and that controller is then used to get better samples. And with the better samples, uh, you're going to learn a better controller and that is going to get, get better samples and going to learn a better controller, and this is sort of a feedback loop in that thing. So this is the way, uh, th so, and th th this theory is about how to learn these controllers uh, for, the, for these systems. So that's a little bit of a uh, looking ahead. So the outline is, um, so we're going to look at uh, control theory, standard control theory today, discrete time control theory, the simplest case, uh, the continuous time control, uh, and then we're going to look at the stochastic case, and we're going to look at the, uh, at the path integral uh, control tomorrow. And here you find on the slide some, uh, uh, some, some material that you can look at. Uh, so, okay. So control, uh, so control problems are uh, what is also known as delayed reward problems. So if you think about learning uh, normally, then uh, the, if you want to, to have two neurons that fire, then the first neuron uh, is, is influencing the second neuron, and if there's a positive correlation, you want to strengthen that link, something like that, right? It's a sort of, a, or if you have feed-forward neural network, you have an input, you have an output, and, and the difference is going to be uh, back-propagated and gives you a change of the weight, but it's all at the same time. In control, you do a sequence of actions, and at the end of the day, you're going to hit the target, yes or no, and depending on that, you evaluate the whole path that you do, right? So it's called, it's called a delayed reward. So the reward comes later, and that is, part, that is the main problem of the control. So control problems arise, of course, in motor control, like in biological systems or in robots. 
where you have to, uh, where you have to control a uh, plant. But also you can think of them in finance, where you have a portfolio and your actions are buy and sell of certain products and your control task is to double your uh, income in, uh, in the period of a year and you have a model of the environment and you do this uh, buy and sell uh, kind of strategy. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's also a control problem. But in effect, learning and our whole life is actually a control problem. Because if you think of it, we, we, we live for about 80 or, uh, or 100 years, and uh, so we get born uh, in the beginning, and then uh, we die at the end, and uh, so we have to make a plan for that. So the plan, what can it be, what can we do? We can go work, we can go to school, we can do all kinds of things. And the, the planning of that life is, is uh, the sensible way to do that, is to go first get your education and then work. Right? You could also have done that, the planning the other way around, first work, then get the education, it's no, no good. Uh, you could also keep on working, uh, start working very early and work your whole life, but that's also not very good. You could also study your whole life uh, and not, never work, that's also not very good. So there is a sort of an optimal way to set up this life in, in, uh, in study and, and work. And you could view this as an optimal control uh, problem where the only purpose of learning is that you can exploit it in life because the best thing, the thing you want to get, your, your reward function is to get the maximum amount of money, say, and then, uh, then your study is only to, uh, to, you know, to get the knowledge that you get you the large amount of money. So, so the, uh, for, for, for cognitive systems, this is also the case. So, for instance, if you, if you have um, uh, uh, well, an example, like you're, you're driving on the road and you're uh, in a car, uh, and you, it's a narrow road, but you, uh, your steering wheel is connected to the wheels as it should be, but you don't know how it's connected. Maybe that if you turn right, that the wheels go to the right. If you turn right, the wheels go to the left. Right? So this is a dangerous situation. Now you have to find out this. Now, now learning uh, how, your wheel, how your steering wheel is connected to the wheels, this is not your, your objective. Your objective is just to stay on the road. But in order to fill that objective to stay on the road, you have to learn this other task, which is how is your wheels connected to that. And in order to solve that, you have to make certain jerks to your, your steering wheel to figure out how this, how this works and get that information. And once you know that, then you can incorporate that then in your planner to, uh, to, get then to, stay, to, to steer on the road because now you would know how it's connected. So the learning of the internal model may be part uh, of the action, actually, right? It's part of the learning, the learning task itself may be an action uh, that you may want to consider. Okay, so this is all very, uh, very complex and we're not going to touch on much of that but I just want you to think about that. So type of control top problems that we can have, we can have uh, fixed horizon, uh, finite horizon uh, control problems, and uh, then you have that the dynamics and the environment may explicitly depend on time, and the uh, optimal control also depends on time, so if you're close to the end, to the horizon, your, your strategy may be different than if there's still a long time to go, right? So this is all in the finite horizon setting. Think about your life, right? If you're almost dead, you're gonna do different things than if you're uh, just born. Um, you can also consider this in a, in a moving horizon. So you have a finite horizon, but now the horizon moves every time you take an action. So you, you're gonna plan, so this is what you happen when you're, bike, when you're biking, right? You have a finite horizon, you're looking, you're making a plan always for three seconds ahead, and then you use the, you do the, the planning within that three seconds, you use the first action of that, of the action what you have to do now to optimize over the first three seconds, and then in the next iteration, you're going to again do that same problem, and your, your horizon keeps on moving forward with you. So this is also a finite horizon, but a moving horizon. You can also have infinite horizon problems, and uh, the most well-known one is the where you have the discounted reward, where you say, okay, the gain that I get uh, immediately on, on short notice is more important to me than the one that I get next week. So you have a discount factor, for instance, gamma to the power t, where, uh, which is the reinforcement learning. Uh, so you get that kind of thing and make sure that the integral uh, over the infinite time is still finite because of this exponential decay. You can also uh, not have that discount factor, then look at total reward. And in that case, uh, you need something to, uh, to make sure that it's integrates. You have an absorbing state uh, that, that allows you, that says the end of the game. Or you can look at average reward. You have an infinite horizon, but you then divide by the, uh, by the, uh, the time interval and take that limit. Uh, the funny thing about the infinite, that the average reward is sort of counterintuitive because uh, the, the, the average reward doesn't care about what, what you do on short notice. So if I do first something wonderful and then uh, do nothing afterwards, or I do first something uh, horrible and then do nothing afterwards, in terms of average reward, there's no difference, right? Because it, it looks at the average over the infinite time and it takes the, 
the, so this is sort of counterintuitive kind of uh, reward. Other issues are uh, we can have discrete versus uh, continuous uh, state. Uh, we can have discrete versus continuous time. Uh, we can have uh, all the states that we're going to do control on, we can have them observable, or we can have them not observable, and there can be noise, of course, in the problem. Now we're going to start with the simplest case, which is the discrete state, discrete time, all observable, no noise. Uh, and this is uh, the case that we're going to be first considering, and then we're going to build our intuition from that, and then ex extend uh, the, the idea. So, here we go. So the discrete state, X is a state, it's, a, it's, a, it's like, a, think of a grid world with a, with your, where you number the, the grid points with, with a number. And so discrete state and we have discrete time. And so in each step, we can go one step, uh, we can have a dynamics. We go from the current state, we go to the next state. And uh, with, a, with a function which may explicitly depend on time, it depends on where we are. And it depends on some control signal. Right, that we want to want to compute, and this control and and this is in the finite horizon. So we're going to do this from t is zero to capital T minus one uh, steps, and um, if we specify the initial state, and if we specify the sequence of controls, then uh, then of course we can compute the whole uh, state sequence. Right, the whole. Uh, so we take first control. We are starting x zero. We take control uh, u zero. We go to state x one. We take control u1, etc. So we get this whole sequence of, uh, of uh, states, and that's this. So now the control problem is to say, okay, I want to optimize this function. And this function is uh, composed of two parts. One is the, is the path cost. This is the cost that I have do, uh, to executing the path. And then I end up in an end state, and that is the cost associated with ending up there. And so this is just a function of my controls, because given my controls, my states are given, and so this is, uh, this is the control cost. And the control problem is to find the sequence of views that minimizes this cost. Right? So that is the, uh, that is the optimal control uh, problem. Yeah? Everybody with me here? OK, so here's an example of uh, how does this, this control problem may look. So for instance, I want to go from A to F, sorry, A to J. Uh, and I can, there's a whole bunch of paths that I can take through these intermediate states. So think of horizontally as this is time, so I have four time steps. And uh, I could, uh, in, in this state, I could take three actions, go here, there, or there. And the cost that I have is two, four, or uh, is it a four? Is it a one? I don't know. Whatever. Uh, this, uh, this, this cost, and I go here, and then I take this path, case cost one, and this path cost three, and this path uh, cost uh, four. And so I get a total cost for this trajectory. And now I want to have the sequence of, of steps. Uh, so particularly my problem is I'm here now. And I want to go in the cheapest way there. And here I have to decide to go here, here, or here, right? And it, it, the choice that I make here may affect the optimality of, uh, where, of my total path, right? So, uh, so the cheapest way to do that, the, the simplest way to do that is just to list all the possible trajectories that I can take and, just and take the best one, right? That's, uh, that's solving the problem. Um, so, but uh, that is, of course, is very difficult, very com com uh, complex, because if in every step I could, for instance, make two, uh, two choices, then uh, if I have a T, capital T steps, then I have two to the power T possibilities. So this explodes uh, in your face, and this I cannot do, typical. So I can do um, something else, which is called dynamic programming. So I start at the end. And I say, well, if I'm, I'm, I'm in here, there's, well, there's no choice. So I, my optimal, my cost to go, so I denote this notion of cost to go, which is the uh, cost of the, from my current state to solve the rest of the problem optimally. Right? So my cost to go from H is 3, and cost to go from I is 4. My cost to go from F, I can go to here this way or I can that way. Right? So it is, it is, my cost to go is uh, 6 plus 3, or it's 3 plus 4. So my cost to go from f is actually 7. Right? That's the best way to do that. And I'll go this way. And I can do it for g and e also. And I can compute the cost to go in any of the intermediate states in terms of the optimal cost to go from the next one. So right, this is the notion. So, it is, so this is the notion that you have to get. So if I, let me give an example with city. So if I want to go, um, if I want to go uh, back home for, to Amsterdam <coughs> from Trieste, uh, I, can, I can go either through uh, Milan or I can go through Rome. And uh, so I have to know how far it is from here to Milan. 
Uh, and then I have to know what is the optimal way to go from Milan to, to Amsterdam. The fact that there are a million ways to go from Milan to Amsterdam, I've solved that problem and the optimal way is such. And the same with Rome. So if I know what the optimal uh, stop to go is from Rome to Amsterdam and from Milan to Amsterdam, I can figure out what the optimal way is to go from uh, uh, Trieste to Amsterdam because I, I can combine it. And so this is this recursion, this is dynamic programming. So in formulas, you, you set it up like this. So this J is, uh, is called an uh, optimal cost to go, and it is the, it is, you take the original cost function that we had here, this one, but now instead of starting at T0, you start it on some intermediate time at some in intermediate state. And that is J is at intermediate time, intermediate state. And you, so you, you have to solve the remaining problem. So the optimization is over the remaining, cost, uh, remaining controls that you have, the, 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 the tail of the, of the control sequence, right? So this is the optimal cost to go. You solve this. And now, uh, if you uh, take the small t equal to the end time, then this sum is empty, and you just have the, the end condition. And if the, small, the big t is equal to the, uh, if the small t is equal to zero, you will get the original uh, control problem, right? So we initialize j at the end, and then we do a recursion backwards in time to get the solution, and this is called dynamic programming. So the way that it works is that here we have, to, again, the definition of j, as I had before, and now I split out, I, I take out the current time uh, optimization, this, this, this step, I take the current time and I take the rest. So this is the rest, this minimization, and then this sum, I split out the current time, s is equal to t, which gives me this term, and then I have the rest. So I have now three terms, and I can see that, uh, that this minimization of all things, that the minimization over t plus 1 to t minus 1, I can take through this one, because this one is only the current time, so it's not affected by this minimization, you can take it through. But of course this part all depends on these optimizations, so I have to put it in there. So we're, we get to this expression. Now, this one we recognize as, as again j, but now evaluated at t plus 1, right? So instead of t is t plus 1. And the state is also changed because it's now x t plus 1. It's the next state that I'm at. Not, I'm not at x. So it's, this is started s is, so x t plus 1 we get here, right? So that we had here x t, uh, s t, x t, right? So you get this here. So you get this recursive relation. And, uh, and so x t plus 1, of course, by the dynamics is x t plus uh, f. So you see that this is uh, this we have to now solve, and this is called the Bellman equation. Um, and so it's a function of time and state. So for each time and state, you have to solve this. So you get an optim you get an optimization uh, optimal value uh, u, which depends on x and t, which is your optimal control at time t in state x, right? So you have to do this essentially at all times and all states. So as an algorithm, it it looks as follows. So you start with your j uh, initializing with the end cost. Then you go backwards in time and you compute the, uh, the u that, that minimizes this right-hand side. And then you evaluate that j that you get there. So that is essentially, uh, that is this j. You, you optim do the optimization, you fill it in and you get, uh, you get this, this value. Well, actually in this equation because, so you have uh, you, you, uh, you have this next u, j, because that's from your initial condition. So you know this value, so you can evaluate it for u, you look for the best one, and the, the, the value that you get is the optimal cost to go, that is this one here. And so then uh, you do that all the way backwards to time zero, and then at time zero you know that you are in state x0, and now you're going to make, uh, you know what is the control in x0, because you have computed the control for all times and all states, so also for the current time. So now you can make a forward step where you take that control in that state and you're going to put, put forward, right? So this is how you go forward. So in the backward step, you actually, so if we go back to this picture here, in the backward step, you actually have to visit all states, right? And all times. And in the forward step, you actually only take one trajectory through it, which is the optimal trajectory. That seems like a waste, that you have to compute the, uh, the cost to go in all states in the backward step, but that's the price you pay for this, uh, for this uh, dynamic programming, because you don't know where the optimal trajectory is going to be later, because you're gonna, you still have to construct it, so therefore you have to compute it for everywhere. Okay, so that is uh, Bellman equation. Uh, 
Okay, so what happens if we, if we add noise to the problem? So here, uh, uh, so one way to add noise is to say, okay, we, my next state is going to be my previous state plus some, uh, some function, which depends on all these three variables I had before, but also on W, which is a random variable, stochastic variable. I, I don't know what it is. Uh, it can, I know maybe it's distribution, but I don't know its value. Right, so an example of such a dynamics is a, is a Brownian, uh, Brownian motion, random walk. So for instance, if the simplest example of this would be xt plus 1 is xt plus wt, where wt is a, is a bit which can be plus or minus 1 with, uh, equal, pro with, uh, some, with equal probability, say, and then the, 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 the dynamics would be this, uh, this, uh, uh, this sum of, uh, of these increments, right? So if you start at zero, you get a bunch of uh, plus ones and a bunch of minus ones, and that's where you are at after, after a certain time. So, uh, so this, this, your state becomes a random variable, and so uh, the cost also becomes a random variable, right? So saying, well, I want to optimize the cost is now a hard thing because the cost itself is a random variable and you cannot optimize a random variable. So what we can optimize is the expectation of a random variable or some statistics of a random variable. So that's what we do. So we put these brackets around this, meaning that we take the expectation over this, over this, uh, over this cost, where xt is now a random variable because it depends on w. I also added now that this cost r also has a random component in it, which we're going to use in the next example. So the cost also has a random component. And so if you, if you, if you uh, write out this expression, it means basically that this is an expectation value with respect to two dis distributions. One is the distribution over all the random variables w that I had, this whole sequence of random variables that I have in the interval from t is zero to time capital T, and other, one, other ones are the random variables that appear here. So I take this value that I get here, and I, I sum over all the possible ways that I can have these random variables, and that gives me that expectation value, right? It's a standard way to compute the expectation value. So, um, so now we are optimizing not uh, the, the cost that we, the, the real cost that we're going to see, because in any experiment we're going to go from state x0 to state x1 to state x2, etc., uh, which is in partly is, is determined by the noise that we, that we have in our system, and we're not going to optimize the cost actually of that actual trajectory that we're going to see, because we cannot, right? Because at time zero, we're not going to know what's going to happen in the future. We're not going to know what kind of uh, W values we're going to see in the future. So the best we can do at time zero is to compute the optimal control in the, in the average case, right? So that is the expected value case, and that is what we are optimizing. So since we don't know the future, we can only optimize expected values that we do know. Right? There's nothing else we can know and we cannot optimize it. So the, the, the closed, what is called closed loop uh, control, to be distinguished from open loop control, is that you find, and in fact we saw already the example in the previous case, in the deterministic case, you find a, a control which is a function of the, st of the time and of the state, right? So this is your control uh, function, in, as we had before. Um, and so what is referred to as a control policy is this whole sequence of functions for all times, right? Or you can say it's the whole function u of x and t, that's the policy, right? Um, and so the optimal policy is the one that, uh, so if this is the dynamics with this noise, and here we put a control which depends on time and on the state, we put it already in there. And with that dynamics and this particular control function that we take, one of these possible control functions, we get a, uh, and we call this set of control, we call, call this pi. With that control function, we are, uh, our expected cost will have a certain value. Right? And the optimal uh, policy that we want to make is, is to pick out that particular control function that minimizes this expectation value. That's it. Right? So it's a very hard program to do, but conceptually it's quite easy. Now this idea of open loop and closed loop control, I, sh I should mention a little bit. So in the, um, in the previous case, in which was the, was the deterministic case, we also got a solution which depends on the, uh, which depends on the, uh, on time and on the, on the control, right? So it's a, on the state. So it's, a, it's a, in that sense, it's also a closed loop control. But since there is no noise, so, um, since, uh, so we have a deterministic system, we go from x0, we go to uh, x1, we go to x2, etc. So since everything is deterministic, um, we can write the u of x, uh, uh, xt and t 
we can write it actually purely as a function of t, right? Because the xt is actually determined by the initial condition and the previous controls. So given the initial condition and given, uh, given this sequence, this x1 is determined by x0 and the, and the control, so this whole be just becomes a sequence of time. There's only one control, there's only one trajectory, optimal trajectory, and with that optimal trajectory, there's only one control sequence also, right? And so the fact that this controller depends on the state, you're never going to use because you're never going to deviate from the optimal trajectory, right? So there is, and this is, and if there's no dependence on the state, then this is called an open loop controller. Because it's sort of like blind, you say, okay, this is, this is the plan, guys. We're going to first go right, then left, then right, then left, and we don't, we don't look anymore what's happening actually where there's any deviation of the plan, because we assume there's no noise, we know exactly what's happened, and so this is called open loop control. Now, in general, when there is noise, of course, it may be that, is, that, there is, that having a fixed control trajectory, uh, control uh, sequence, So you may say, I'm going straight ahead, but if the wind is blowing from the left, you go to the left. If the wind is blowing from the right, you go to the right. And based on that, on that, that random event, your next step is going to be something that depends on the state, not only on time. Right? And that's called closed-loop control, where you take the feedback, with this, the sensory feedback, into account. Okay, so that is, uh, that's called closed-loop control, and that's a control policy. Uh, okay. So if we take this stochasticity into account and put it into the Bellman equation, like let, let me remind you of this Bellman equation, it was uh, uh, this, this equation here. So if we now put the stochastic element in there, so we're going to have that the R, this depends on, uh, on the noise here, because we had put noise in here, and the dynamics also depend on the noise. So if you repeat this analysis, all that has happened is that you just have to put uh, uh, expectation values around this whole thing on the right hand side. That's, that's the upshot of that, of that, dealing with that uncertainty. So we now have to take the minimum of this expectation value and we still have the, uh, the, end, uh, the boundary value at the, at the end cost. And so then this is the stochastic Bellman equation that we have to solve. So let's look at an example. So I have an ice cream shop selling Italian ice cream and, uh, but it's a very small one. I can only have uh, one, zero, one or two ice creams in my shop. Um, and, um, and T is, uh, is, is, is labeling the days, day one, day two, etc. And so at the beginning, I have a number of ice creams in my shop. And I can order, uh, but I cannot hold more than two. So if I have zero ice creams, I can order two maximally. If I have one ice cream, I can order one, etc. So this is what I can order. So my, my control is, uh, is what I order. Is, and it is in, uh, it's between, uh, it's less than two minus, uh, minus the number that I have. Um, and then the, in the same day, my shop opens, and then there is uh, people coming. Uh, and there is uh, zero, one or two people uh, coming, but I don't know. I just don't know, I just know from past experience that the probability that nobody comes is about 10%, the probability that one person comes is about 70%, and the probability that two person come is about 20%. This is what I know. Right? And so, uh, and so after, after, at the end of the day, I have uh, first ordered some ice creams. Uh, so I put up my stack. And now I have, uh, I'm waiting, people coming by ice creams. And at the end of the day, I'm left with some ice creams. And I did the, what I've left over, I have to put in storage. And that is, of course, uh, that is, uh, cost me money. Uh, and also, uh, if, I, if, there's more demand, if there's more demand than I can supply, right? if more people come than... Uh, uh, then I have ice creams, I cannot sell them, and that's also a loss. So, in other words, at the end of the day, I want my, uh, my ice cream uh, content in my, in my store to be close as possible to zero. If it, is, if it would be less than zero, I could, you know, negative, I could have sold more. If it's more than zero, I have to store, which is also a, a bad idea. So, I, I have two costs. One is the cost of purchasing ice cream, which is proportional to the number that I, uh, that I purchase, which is you itself. And then I have the second term, which is quadratic, which is just basically x plus u minus w is xt plus 1, right? This is the, the, the amount that I have at the, uh, today plus what I buy minus what I sell. This is this, this amount. And so this one has to be so close possible to zero. So my total cost is, is of this form, 
right? This is the cost I have over a certain horizon, and I keep it also very, very number, small number of, of days, so two days, and this is my dynamics. So the, the next, uh, the next, my next day number of ice creams is the previous number of ice creams plus the ones that I buy minus the ones that I sell, and if it gets less than zero, uh, everything is, is lost. If it gets less than zero, it's, uh, it's put on zero. And so I have to, this is a control problem, so I can, um, uh, I can apply the, the Bellman equation, so I start uh, with time three when the horizon is empty uh, and then the cost is zero because there was no phi term, right? So then, then I initialize this at zero for all x3 and now I can, uh, I can uh, solve this for, uh, for x... Uh, uh, I can solve this for, uh, for x2 and x1, etc. So, so, so suppose that we had time two and uh, we have uh, stock is uh, x2 and then the cost to go is, uh, is what we order and how much we have left it, uh, at the end. So the, the jx2, just using the, the formula, we get the minimum. The u2 can be between 0 and 2 minus x2, right? That was this kind of constraint on what it could buy of the cost, uh, the immediate cost, plus the j, but the j was 0, right? Which was the future cost. So we just get this one. So we get this expectation value. Now, the expectation value is not over this one because this is a deterministic variable that we have here. And this expectation value means 0 0.1 times that the value of W2 is 0, plus 0 0.7 that the value of W2 is 1, plus 0 0.2 times that the value of W2 is 2. So we get these three things. And then we have to <laughs> minimize this expression over, uh, over, the, over U2. Uh, and, uh, and so we can do that. And so we find that for u2 is 0, we find 1.5. For u2 is 1, we find 1.3. And for u2 is 2, we can do that. So the minimum one is u2 is 1. So we find that, uh, that for x2, uh, for x2 is 0, uh, the optimal control is that u2 has to be 1. So if, if on day 2 uh, I have no ice creams, I should order 1. This is what this says. And the cost is this. Right, so this is very spelled out for this particular case, but now you can repeat it and you get uh, this. So at stage two, where we were, if we have zero ice creams, we should order one. If we have one ice cream, we do the same thing, we should order zero. If we have two ice creams, we should order zero. And the cost that you are left with is, uh, is this. And then that back propagates to the, uh, to, the, to the previous time. So then you can do it at the previous stage. Uh, you see that if you have zero once, you should order one. If you have one, you should order zero, etc. It turns out actually that at all the three stages, you should do the same thing. But that's a, that's an accident of the uh, of the exercise. It could be different, of course, because the optimal control is explicitly time dependent. So in this way, you solve this control problem, and so you see that uh, at the beginning of your uh, long summer of two days, you know that uh, you know exactly the answer. That if you have uh, uh, if you have zero stock, you should on the first day you should order one. This is what you should do. Right? This is optimal, given that the model is correct, of course. Okay, so this is uh, a very simple illustration of, uh, of this optimal control. Here's another example. This is a case of two ovens, and I want to, I have a certain uh, material which uh, has an initial temperature uh, x0, and then I have an oven, first oven of a temperature u0, and after that my, the temperature of my, my material will be x1, and then I put it through a second oven, and then uh, the temperature will be x2. And so in this case, um, the, the dynamics is on the temperature. So the temperature 1 is, is, a, a, is a convex combination of the previous temperature and the oven temperature. right? So it's a mixture of these two. So we get uh, this. And this is a hold for both ovens here. And so this, is you see, is a linear dynamics in, in x. And you see a, a, we get a cost. We just care about two things. One is that the final temperature is close to a certain uh, target temperature, x star. This is what we want to design. And we are, the, the way the, so much of we like is, is, is quantified by this r. If r is very large, we want it very much. If r is very small, we don't want it so much. And the second thing is the energy that we spend in the two ovens, which is proportional to the, to the temperature squared. And so we get these two terms. Right? So this is now our control problem. And we want to optimize this. And this is an interesting case because here you see the dynamics is linear and the cost is quadratic, both in the state and in the, in the controls. If I, uh, if I go do this exercise, I go for the, uh, for the end cost. So here's an end cost term, that is, that is this end cost term. So we initialize the j at the time 2 for any, any temperature, is just this, uh, this uh, end cost. 
And now we can compute the j at time one for an arbitrary state uh, x1 by doing this Bellman equation. I get the, the, the immediate cost, which is u1 squared, which is the, uh, the oven temperature. Uh, this is this one, right, this oven temperature. Uh, and I get the cost to go from j2. So I have to put in this uh, uh, from, from state two, uh, time two. And so I fill in this thing where I replace, uh, uh, where I put j uh, uh, x2. And now I fill in, for uh, x2, I fill in the dynamics, which is uh, 1 minus a x1 plus a, a u1. So I put this in here. And so I now get this quadratic expression in terms of, uh, of u. And I can do the minimization because quadratic form minimizing is very easy. I get the solution u is something linear in x. I get this as a solution. And I can fill this solution. I can fill it back in here. And you see that the result is again something that is quadratic in, uh, in x. Right? And so now I can repeat. I put this j, I put it in here. Uh, in this one, fill it in here, put in the dynamics x1 in terms of x0, that's done here. I optimize again with respect to u0. I again get something which is linear in, uh, in, in x, and I get uh, the j, which is again quadratic, uh, quadratic in x. Right? So, in other words, this is uh, something that, that perpetuates, so you stay in the same form, you can do this in closed form. So, um, so this is a, an example of a linear quadratic control uh, problem, one of the most well-studied and well-understood uh, uh, control problems. And, and it has this feature that you get a closed-form solution, right? You get here a closed-form solution of the control in terms of the parameters of the model. And, um, and you don't get this, this well, in the tabular case with the, with the ice cream store, that you have to do this all cases, so you can get it much easier by differentiating, getting the optimal solution. Another nice thing about this, this, uh, this linear quadratic control is, is, is a feature called certainty equivalence. And that means that the, uh, that the optimal control solution that we compute does not depend on the presence of noise. That is to say, if my problem were to be noisy, I would still compute the same optimal control. And that's easy to see. For instance, if we, um, if we say uh, that the dynamics is now is the same, this linear dynamics, but now we have this noise term added to it, say, right? And the, uh, and the cost is, is, still, uh, is still the same. If we do it in this case, we get that, for instance, in this computation for J1, we have to fill in now uh, for X1, uh, for X2, we have to fill in uh, uh, this, this equation for X1, so we get this, this noise term in here. And if I now take... Uh, we sum out this square, we take all the terms that involve uh, not w1, so we get this term that we had before, and then we have a double product term, and then we get a w1 square term. And you see the double product term vanishes because if the noise has mean zero, because it's linear in w, and then we get a w square term, which is independent of, the opt of u, the independent of the optimization. So in other words, we see that we, if we optimize this expression, it doesn't matter whether there is noise because we get the same value of u1 that we would have gotten in the noiseless case, right? And that is saying that the optimal control doesn't depend on the effect of whether the plant is noisy or not. Now, that's great because often you don't know uh, what the noise is, so it's good to, to have this, this kind of thing. Now, this, this certainty equivalence holds in the linear quadratic case. Now, we saw a wonderful example uh, earlier today of non-certainty equivalence, right? Because the, the drunken spider... When there was no noise, you had one control, and if there was noise, there was another control. So that's a clear example of a violation of the certainty equivalence where you get uh, very different solutions. So this is, uh, of course, the fact that this, this problem, you can think of it as a multimodal problem, whereas it, whereas a solution this way, there's one corridor there, one corridor there, with a big valley in between, and whereas in the linear quadratic case, everything is sort of a convex, one unimodal kind of a problem, and that's why you get this uh, certainty equivalence. Any questions? Okay, so now, um, now we can take the continuous limit. And actually, so we have done the hardest part, actually, because uh, this is, uh, if you understand this, then the, then the rest is sort of uh, easy. Uh, it's just a bit of math and it may be, look a little bit scary, but in fact, conceptually, it's, it's very much the same. So, okay, let's take the continuous time limit. So in, we had uh, discrete time, t plus 1 and t, etc. We're now going to have t plus dt. 
and we're going to send dt to zero. So our Bellman equation, uh, our dynamics is now this form, xt plus dt is xt plus f dt, right? And our, our cost is now an n term and, a, and an integral uh, of, of terms, right? And so, uh, so if we now take this, uh, this Bellman equation that we had uh, here, so we get, uh, wait, no, the, uh, this one. So we get, uh, so xt, so here we place xt plus dt, and here we get f, uh, x plus f dt, right? So that's what we get. So then we get uh, uh, this situation. So we just, we do the discrete time control for the case that the discretization is, is small. And so we get j is the min over u of this r dt, which you get from, uh, from this uh, one term. And we get then j t plus dt x f plus x plus f dt, right? And now, if these functions are smooth, we can do a Taylor series expansion, right? So we can, we get this one, which is proportional to dt, and then we get j, we can evaluate it at t and x, and then we get the first derivative with respect to t, we get dt times uh, the gradient with respect to, to this j sub t means the, the j dt, and then we get a space derivative, the j dx, the gradient, times delta x, which is uh, f dt, right? And now you see that, that here a j is on both sides, and, and for, furthermore, this j doesn't depend on u, so we can just cancel it, so it falls out. And you see that the rest is all proportional to dt, so we can divide it out. And then we can take this thing, which doesn't depend on, on u, we can take it to the other side, and then we're left with this equation. Here, right? See that? So we get now a uh, partial differential equation with a, with a scalar value u, uh, uh, j depending on x and t, and there's some time derivative, there's some space derivative, there's some functions multiplying it, and there is this nasty uh, minimization is in there. And this partial differential equation has to be solved with the boundary condition still the same, that at the end time it has to be equal to this phi of, phi of x. Right, so this is now the continuous Bellman equation, also known as the hamilton jacobi bellman equation, because the hamilton jacobi part comes from classical physics, because there's actually a, a close tie between uh, classical mechanics and control theory. You can sort of say that classical mechanics is a sort of a special case of control theory in the mathematical sense. And the equations that arise in the classical mechanics are known, are, were derived by Hamilton and Jacobi uh, in the 19th century. And uh, the, the, the control formulation is due to Bellman, is from the 50s of the, the 1950s. Uh, but so that's why it's called. So this, this equation, this Bellman equation, uh, can be, can be uh, uh, visualized in this way. So we have, uh, this, is a, this is a space at the end time, this is space at our current time, and this is the phi at the end time, phi of x, right? This is a boundary condition for j. So what, is this, what this equation does is it morphs this phi of x, which exists at the end time, into something else at an earlier time because you're, you're doing backwards in time. And so, uh, so the picture is like this. So you first have this kind of a shape, and then you, you, you solve this equation. You get for each time, you get a j. Uh, at the end time, it looks like phi, and at earlier times, it looks like something else, and it morphs to something. And at our current time, it will look like something like this. And you, the, way to, uh, the way that it's called is called an anticipated potential. So there's a potential that lives at the end time, uh, but that's not your concern. You want to know what to do now, not at the end time. So to translate that end potential to the current situation, what you do now, you have to compute this anticipated potential, which is, which is this solution J at, at, the current, at the current time. So the, the, the control that you compute, you can view often uh, as a gradient flow in the anticipated potential. So if you were at the end time, you would take a gradient of this, and that would be your control. If you are in the anticipated potential right now, you have to take a gradient in this, in this shape. So that is how this control... Uh, How you solve the equation? Yeah, we're going to look at that. So this is the whole, this is the difficult thing, right? So in principle, this is a beast of an equation, and you cannot solve this equation. And this is where you get stuck. And this is particularly if you now add noise to the, to the problem, because this is still not a stochastic problem. Uh, if you add noise, it gets even harder. Or no, I shouldn't say it. It gets, it's equally hard. Um, and, um, but yeah, that's indeed, that's the, that's the topic of the, of the two lectures. Okay, so let's, let's take an example. So here we have a mass on a spring, 
So there is a, there's a spring force which acts in the z direction, which is minus the position, right? So if, we, if, the, if, the, if the spring is up, if the ball is up, the, the force is downwards. If the, if, the, if the ball is down, the force is upwards. So that's spring force. And then there is a control force, which is just a control that we put. And so uh, we get that the total force, which is minus z plus u, is equal to uh, m times uh, a, is the acceleration. This is uh, Newton's law, right? So this is our, this is our uh, Newton's law here. And now we take the mass equal to 1 because it uh, saves uh, typing. Uh, and uh, so now we have this dynamical system. And now our question is, uh, given initial position and velocity, uh, z at 0 and uh, z dot at 0, uh, so dot means a derivative, uh, time derivative, right? For those who don't know, time derivative. Say 0 at time 0, find the control path uh, that's bounded in the interval minus 1 plus 1 over a time interval from 0 to t, such that uh, at the end time, the position of the ball is maximal, right? This is, we want to get it as high as possible. This is the control task we want to do. So, so how we, would we do that? Well, first of all, we have a dynamical system which involves a second derivative. We don't want that because our, our theory is in terms of first derivative. So we have to, but that's very easily solved because we, we make two variables, x1 and x2. x1 is z and x2 is z dot, right? It's the velocity. So then you find that x1 dot is uh, z dot, and z dot is x2, so x1 dot is, z, is x2, right, you find? And you find that x, x2 dot is z double dot, and that was, uh, that was z double dot was minus z plus u, and z is x1, so that's this. So we convert this one-dimensional second-order equation to uh, two-dimensional two equations of first order, right? That's the standard trick. So now we have it in the standard form, so we have the, the change of x is a function of x and some control, and we have an end cost that z has to be maximal, but we we're in the business of minimizing, so we need that this phi, which is minus z, uh, has to be, is the end cost, then has, this has to be minimal. And the path cost, how we get there, uh, we don't care. We didn't specify it, so that cost is zero, so this r is zero. So if we take the, the AGB equation now, uh, we get, uh, we have to solve, let me put it here. So r is zero, and this f we just got in this two-dimensional form, so we got, um, so the gradient, so we got, uh, so we got uh, f gradient uh, j. This is equal to uh, f1 uh, dj dx1 plus f2 dj dx2. Right? It's two components, and f1 was the first component of the of the of the dynamics. So f1 is x2 dj dx1 uh, plus an f2 was uh, minus, uh, what is it, minus x1 plus u dj dx2. Right, so this is that, uh, that term. So that is, that is, uh, that's in here. And so now uh, we have to minimize with respect to u. Now, u was bounded in the interval plus or minus 1. Now, it better be like that, because we see that uh, this function depends linearly on u. So if we would have u uh, unbounded, it would go to, uh, to minus infinity. Then we don't want it. That's why it's bounded in min plus or minus 1. And the optimal value, the minimal value that you get, is, of course, depends on the sign of this one. If it is positive, we have to get u as minus 1. If it is negative, we have to get u as plus 1. In other words, u is equal to minus the sign of, uh, of this term. In other words, this optimizer goes to the absolute, minus the absolute value of this second term. This is how this optimization uh, that, and u is, is minus the sign of this. So this is what we get. So this is our differential equation that we now have to solve. Now this is to come, uh, this is still not easy to solve, but uh, you know, we have some hindsight, uh, or as let's say an ansatz, as we were German about it, then um, we can say, okay, let's look for a solution which is linear in x with some time-dependent components. Let's say, let's, let's uh, do this ansatz. So if you put that in there, and I don't have time to do it really, but if you, if you put that in there, then you get uh, some, uh, some x-dependent terms, x-1-dependent terms, x-2-dependent terms, and x-independent terms, and you collect them all, uh, you put that in, and you essentially, uh, this partial differential equation becomes now three ordinary differential equations. One for, for phi 1, this component, uh, where the time drift is equal to phi 2, 1 for phi 2, uh, and 1 for this alpha. Uh, so these are now the equations that we need to solve. And we had boundary conditions for the, uh, for the, for the, for the 
for phi, for, for j, had to be equal to minus x1. So the boundary conditions also translate in the boundary condition of the phi1 has to be equal to minus 1 because it has to be equal to uh, minus to equal to phi. And, and the phi2 is 0 and alpha is 0. So we get these boundary conditions for these three uh, uh, things. And now we see that, um, that phi1 and phi2 can be solved self-consistently. Self uh, and we can, uh, we can very, very easily verify that this, the solution of these two equations is given by just uh, this system of uh, sines and cosines, right? It's solving this, this system. So if you take phi equal to cap the, the t equal to the capital T, you will find indeed that this gives a minus 1. And if this one gives it capital T, it gives equal to 0. So this is the solution of this system. And then, um, then we see that the control is... Uh, is the gradient of the cost with respect to J2. That means that if you take the gradient with respect to X2, you get something that doesn't depend on, uh, on, on alpha. So we're not interested in alpha. In fact, we're only interested in phi2, but uh, for that we need also to solve phi1. But we have now solved phi1 and phi2, right? So, okay, we, we do that, so we get the solution is minus the sign of, uh, of phi2, in a sense, and that is the si phi2 was the sign of this, so we get minus the sign of the sign uh, this, right? Um, and so, if you now take the capital T equal to 2 pi, you find that the solution that x, that u is optimal, uh, the optimal u is minus 1 in the interval between 0 and pi, and it is uh, 1 in the interval pi to 2 pi. That's for following this, uh, this uh, solution. And so you see that uh, the solution is that the spring, what you first do is you first pull it down for the half period, and then you push it up for the second half of the period. And that gives you the maximum deflation. And here's the uh, solution. So this is the, uh, this is the position. So it goes from its origin, it goes down, and then it pushes up, uses the, uses the spring force to get at the end time at the maximum position. So this is uh, an example of how you solve these control systems. So uh, you may wonder that, uh, that this is a very partic uh, particular case that you can solve, and of course this is the case. Um, and in general, these, these systems are very, uh, very hard, to, uh, very hard to, uh, to solve. Let me see how far I'm doing in time. Um, I, have, I have still half an hour, more or less. Okay. Uh, any questions about this? So control problems, we can set up a Bellman equation in the continuous time, and we can uh, solve this if we know the dynamics. So let me, okay, so now let me go on to the, um, so one thing that we found is that actually this, uh, this J that we had here was, 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 has to solve a partial differential equation for all space. And actually, in the end, we only need one trajectory because we have a noiseless uh, situation, right? So the picture is, is like this. So here we have again this picture, that we have the end condition, the phi at the end, and then we have this, uh, this, this anticipated potential that we compute for all states. But then again, our initial position is maybe this, and our optimal trajectory is going to be this red line uh, walking over the time from uh, current uh, to end, right? And so the question is, can we uh, avoid this, uh, this partial differential equation and just directly compute this red line without doing this all space, uh, this all space dependence. Now you can, um, now you can do that, uh, and the, uh, uh, yeah, so you, you, you can do that. Uh, I'm not, let me, yeah, I'm just a little bit. Uh, um, okay, uh, let me just, do it, and those who follow, those who follow, follow, and those who, those who have difficulty with this part uh, may now go to sleep, and then, uh, and those who follow then can, uh, can continue to follow, and then I'll wake you up in about five minutes, and then we will take it, we'll take it from there. Okay, so what you do is, so, okay, so we're going to set up a optimization problem, which is now we want to minimize the cost. Right, this is what we wanted to minimize. And normally we want to minimize the cost and we said, well, we have a dynamics uh, and we're going to do this Bellman equation, but now we're going to do something else. We're going to say, we're going to consider the trajectory over controls and the trajectory over states as two independent variables. And we're going to optimize both. But of course they depend on each other, right? If I, if I have a, um, so if I have uh, uh, x0 and I have u0, 
these together will give me uh, uh, x uh, dt, time dt, and I take uh, u uh, dt, and that will give me uh, x of uh, uh, 2 dt, right, 2 time steps, etc. And so um, it, is fair to, it is clear that if I, if I specify uh, all the controls, all the dynamics is given. So there is a dependence between these two sets of variables, right? So the way, um, the way that I implement it is that I set up a constraint, which is the dynamics. The dynamics, this is the dynamics, and the dynamics sets up a constraint between these variables, right? And so, um, so, I, so the way, th who, who knows about Lagrange multipliers? That's the part that is uh, not asleep, I guess. That, so, uh, so Lagrange multipliers allow you to enforce constraints. And, I'm, uh, and so I'm just going to present it as a trick. So you, what you, you, so if you want to, okay, let me just give the, so if you want to minimize a function uh, with respect to x, some c of x, right? But now you want to minimize it uh, such that, uh, that g of x is zero, say that x has to be in a certain set, that is specified by this constraint, then this can be written equivalently that you say I do minimization over x and the maximization over lambda of c of x plus lambda g of x. So if you, uh, if you introduce this, then this lambda, max, this Lagrange multiplier is make sure that if you maximize this, everywhere where g is non-zero, this will make maximization, will get it, put it to infinity. And if you then do further the minimization, all these points become irrelevant. So all the things that, that this thing can, can put to infinity are excluded from the minimization, and therefore you do actually the minimization over the set where it's zero. Right? So this is the idea of the Lagrange multiplier. So now we're going to have Lagrange multipliers on the constraint x dot is f of x u t. So this is a this is a this is a constraint that's happened at each time, right? So there is a many time, and so we're going to have a Lagrange multiplier which depends on time. It's a time dependent function. So we get for each time we get this constraint. So we get this constraint that the difference is equal to zero. So this difference is equal to zero. This is my g of x. So this difference is, is having a Lagrange multiplier. And the Lagrange multiplier enters uh, here. So here I have my optimization, which is this part. And the Lagrange multiplier is this lambda t integrated for all times. So I have a Lagrange multiplier for each time of this difference, of this equation. And so then I can define h as a, just as an administration, uh, r minus lambda f. So that's uh, taking part of it. And then we have uh, a lambda uh, x dot term here. And now, this is the thing we want to optimize. Now we're going to optimize with respect to the whole trajectory x, the whole trajectory u, and the whole trajectory lambda. And we're going to take derivatives and set all these derivatives equal to zero. And then uh, we're going to look for a point of c where the derivative with respect to all these changes is zero. It's a stationary point. This is called the variational argument. And, and it will lead to some uh, miraculous uh, solutions. So if we, if we do this, delta c, so that is the the change of the, uh, so we're going to differentiate this with respect to, to x, so we get the phi dx times delta, uh, delta x at the end time, that's this thing, the phi dx, the sub x means derivative, the phi dx at delta x, and then we take the derivative of this whole uh, integrand thing here, so we get h derivative with respect to x, with respect to u, with respect to lambda, and we have to take this one also with respect to lambda and with respect to x. So we get all these terms here, and uh, they're all fine because we want to now set the, the coefficients of everything that's multiplying delta x, delta u, and delta lambda, we want to set it equal to zero. But we have here this one term, which is delta uh, x dot, and uh, we have to get rid of that. And we can ri get rid of that by partial integration. So we say that the integral from zero to t, uh, lambda delta x dot, so delta x dot is the delta of dx dt, which is equal to the ddt of uh, delta x. So we can write this as the integral from 0 to t, lambda ddt delta x. And now we can... Um, we, can uh, we can do partial integration. So this is minus the integral from 0 to t of uh, the lambda dt delta x plus um, lambda delta x 
evaluated at zero and t, right? So this gives uh, uh, minus t uh, lambda dot delta x plus lambda at the end time delta x at the end time minus lambda at zero delta x at zero. Now, the variation that we do is, is in, the, in the plane from zero to, to t, and we have all these trajectories, but we st keep always the initial condition at, at, the, at the same spot. So that means that the delta x at zero is in fact zero because you don't vary there, right? We, we, we keep a fixed initial condition. So this term is absent. So we're just left with these two terms, and you will find these, that, there are, uh, that, uh, that this one is, uh, is the one that's there, and the other one is this... Uh, uh, lambda dot uh, delta x is in here. Okay, so now we're done, essentially, because now we can set uh, all the... So this delta c is equal to zero if uh, the coefficient of this and the coefficient of this and the coefficient of this are all zero, and if this term is zero. Now, this term is zero gives us a, a boundary condition that the gradient of the end cost has to be equal to, uh, to, to minus lambda at the end time, so that's a boundary condition. And these ones give us, give us differential equations. So we can first solve for this one, the, the HDU is zero, so we're going to solve for that. And um, so this formally, so U, H depends on, on X, U, and lambda. And so taking this derivative equal to zero gives us formally a solution of U in terms of T, X, and lambda. And now the other two are, are then given in the following way. We get an X that dot is the H, D, lambda where the solution of u is in there, and lambda dot is minus the h, the x. And we get initial boundary condition that x at initial one is, has x zero, and the boundary condition at the end time is that lambda is minus phi x, which came from, from this term that we picked up here, which also has to be zero. So, um, maybe now time to, to get awake in, again. So the, uh, so the upshot is that you can do a variational uh, argument where you get the solution directly in terms of two coupled ordinary differential equations. So these are ordinary differential equations, like, like, uh, like Newton's law, uh, but they're coupled, and they have mixed boundary conditions. So there is a, the, there's two variables. One is x and one is lambda. x has an initial condition at the initial time, and lambda has a condition at the end time, which actually depends on x. So it's a mixed boundary value problem that you have to, have to solve. Um, so, uh, so if we do this for the mass of the spring, we will see that it gets directly the solution. So we had the dynamics was, was of this form. The cost was of this form. If we take the Hamilton, this H that, that I defined, it has this form of lambda x2 plus lambda 2 uh, this. This is the form of uh, this, this expression. If we compute this h star, where we optimize over u, that I, which was this step, right? This is the optimization over u, set equal to zero. If we optimize over u, we find, but u is bounded in interval plus or minus one, we find that this h star has this, is this value. We recognize it's almost the same as the differential equation that we had before, with the absolute values in there. And then from this, we can compute the equations of motion, these Hamilton equations of motion. x dot is the hd lambda, lambda dot is minus the hd x. And so we see that the first equation, in fact, gives us back our original dynamics. This is this dynamics here. This is just an equation of motion dynamics where we now have replaced u by its optimal value. And the, uh, the, the new thing is the dynamics of lambda, which is, uh, which is this equation, and which was the same that we got this sin, sinusoidal uh, solution where we had previously these psi's, right? This, this is exactly the same equation that we had uh, here. For the, for the psi's, the same uh, kind of thing. So it gives these sine solutions. So, uh, and so this is, uh, this is the way that you can do this with the Pontryagin uh, 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 principle. So um, here's another example. So suppose I have a linear quadratic control problem. So my change in the position is just a u, it's the control. And I want to be at an end, uh, I start at some initial value. I want at the end, I want to be uh, at the origin. So I penalize to be away from the origin uh, uh, at the end time, and I have a quadratic uh, control cost. So if I solve this uh, in, the, in the PMP formalism, you find here the equations. I'm not going to do it. Uh, and you can just follow this recipe. You construct a Hamiltonian. You optimize the Hamiltonian with respect to u. You get a function of, uh, of x and lambda. You get these equations of motion with the boundary conditions, and you solve it. And what you find 
is that the optimal control in this case, which is lambda equal to u star, is, is, of, this, is of this form. So you see that you get a feedback controller that, that steers towards the, uh, it's, it's minus alpha x, so it always steers towards the origin, and it steers with a gain, which is, uh, has this term, which decreases with time, uh, which increases with time, sorry. So if t0, which is your current time, if that goes to the end time, then uh, actually this gain factor, minus alpha over 1 plus alpha uh, t minus t, uh, gets stronger and stronger. So the picture is that you have, uh, that you start, you start uh, initially at some state, and you want to get to the end at the origin, and what you will do is that you uh, will steer uh, towards, uh, towards this position. And uh, the, um, for, for, the, for, for, if for the same x, you will find that you get, a, get an increasing uh, control strength. So the urgency is, is larger there than, than, than here at this point. So this is, in the absence of noise, this is still a very uh, simple deterministic uh, situation. So in relation to classical mechanics, I'm going to skip. Uh, yeah. Okay. So okay. So let's add some uh, stochasticity in this continuous uh, control formulation. So we have now we have these 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 um, uh, capital things denoting stochastic variables, uh, and we have. Um, so suppose that we're on discrete time, and we would have uh, just this situation that the current uh, x is uh, it goes in the new x. With, uh, with some uh, uh, random variable, uh, uh, plus or minus one. So then after time t time steps, x is just the sum of the increments, right? So we get this value. So we can compute uh, this x, since it's the sum of independently distributed variables, we know that uh, its distribution, the distribution of x is going to become Gaussian, right? Because the uh, sum of random variables in a large, large sum limit is Gaussian distributed, because if they're independent. So if this is Gaussian distributed, we know that we only have to compute the mean and the variance, so then we're done, because that defines the whole Gaussian. So the mean is the expected value of x, it's zero, because each of these terms has the expected value zero. And the variance is, uh, is the sum of the variances of each of these terms, and each of the variance has a, has a variance one, right? And so we get a sum of one, so we just get t, right? So we see that, um, uh, in this way, we see that these fluctuations, that they grow with the square root of, uh, of time, right? So this is the, the width, the, 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 the width of, uh, grows with the square root of time. So this we can use as a starting point for the continuous time formulation. So in the continuous time, we get something similar, that the change in x is just the x at the new step minus the late one, is just this, uh, this, this what is called this, uh, this Wiener process, this, uh, this infinitesimal Gaussian thing, which is, uh, has also mean zero, uh, zero and, a, and a variance, which is now also dt, is dt, right? So we had a time interval, so we take the, 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 the key insight here is that where we had here this variance proportional to t, we take that to the infinitesimal scale. So we get now the variance is proportional to dt because that's our time step. And the new is just a factor to scale the size of the noise. We can take it also one. So we, the, the, the x at time, at time t is the, uh, is the x at time uh, t1, which we call x1, plus uh, the integral of all these increments. So this is this stochastic integral. And so from this, we can compute the, uh, the expected value of uh, xt. It's the expected value of uh, this one, which is x1. Sorry, it should be an x1 here. Uh, plus the expected value of this one, which is 0. So we get uh, this one. And we get the variance of the sum. Is, uh, is the sum of the variances, the variance of this one is zero, and we get the variance of this one, each of these one has variance dt, we're integrating dt, it gives us a uh, new times, so it gives us t, right? The variance of that thing. So this, uh, this process, uh, the, this variable at time t can be described as a Gaussian distribution, which has a mean which is given by, uh, uh, in, so it, it's a mean, has a mean value x1, and it has a variance which is t, uh, or new times, times the time difference, right? So if we go from time one to time two, and we start at position x1, uh, then the probability to see it at that position x2 is just a Gaussian distribution, x2 minus the mean value, uh, divided by uh, the, 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 the variance, and the variance is nu times the, the time difference, which is t2 times minus t1. And so this is the, uh, 
this is the distribution of the stochastic process. So if we now go to stochastic differential equations, now we're going to add a nonlinear term. So we have this term we have explained, but now we're going to add some deterministic term, which is just our normal dynamics that we have in this system. Right? So in this case, this conditional distribution uh, is very comp can be very complex, and we don't know really uh, what it looks like. But um, there are two equations that are useful for the, to describe them. So there are evolution equations that describe this distribution. So one is that we take this argument fixed, so initial time and initial space, so we fix the initial position, and we, we ask ourselves what happens to rho if we evolve forward in time. And this is known as the Fokker-Planck uh, forward equation. And it is a, it is, it has, if, uh, if you take it in this form, uh, th this is this equation that you get. So it has a, a so-called drift term, which describes this, this part, and it has a diffusion term, which describes this, new, this, this noise uh, part. And the initial condition is that you initialize at a certain state. And you can also, but you can also describe this equation, uh, this process, by, uh, by fixing uh, the end uh, uh, variable and varying, looking at it as a, as a dynamical process in, the, in this variable. So you define psi xt as for some end time you are at a fixed state z, and you look at it as a function of this initial variable. And then this, this, variable, this, this uh, quantity has also a differential equation associated with it, which is called the Kolmogorov backward equation. And it has boundary conditions at the end time, so at capital T, and it is given by this differential equation. It also has a drift term, which is similar to this one, but not quite, because here the gradient is over both terms, and here the gradient is only over, over one of the terms. And it has a diffusion term, which is identical. Right? So, okay, these are two descriptions that can be used uh, to, uh, to model this, uh, this stochastic differential equation. So, for instance, if you have a Gaussian, then, um, then the, 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 the forward process is given by this, by this row that we already described, this Gaussian like this. Uh, and the backward process is given by, also by a Gaussian, but it has a width which increases with the time to the end. So the picture is, is quite, is quite uh, confusing in a sense. Um, so, uh, I, um, so suppose that I... Uh, so the forward picture is quite easy. I start here in the origin, say, and I have some sort of a diffusion process like this, and this is a Gaussian, so if I take any time, that this is a Gaussian distribution like this, right? So this is the, the forward picture. Now the backward picture is saying, um, I fix an end time, and I fix a, a state z, and now I'm asking myself, what is the probability to come from any uh, time and state to that state z, right? Now you can think, you can think that if you, uh, that if you are very uh, close to this z, if this difference is small, then this is a big probability, right? If you're right in front of it. But if you're very far away, this is a very small probability, right? To go from this state to that state is very small. And in fact, that distribution is also, in this case, the Gaussian distribution, similar, and that's given by this. And the, f the, the closer you get to the end time, so this, this is time is t, is, uh, capital T minus T, the smaller this gets, the narrower that Gaussian gets, because the harder it is to hit that probability, that, uh, that end state. So that's this distribution that gets narrower when you get further in time. So uh, it's, um, so this, um, the forward equation is a, is a diffusion that extends this way, the backwards equation is a diffusion that extends this way, but that backwards equation, that backwards diffusion, should not, is, is still describing this same good old process, this one, which, which moves forward in time and gets, gets more, more, uh, more noisy. So it should not be confused that this backward equation is sort of modeling uh, something where, where, the, 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 where the diffusion is, where the noise is actually getting less. That's not the case. It's just this picture of it. Okay, so now, uh, now we're ready to, uh, to go into the... Uh, uh, stochastic optimal control uh, formulation. So, so actually, it's, we're almost uh, there. So don't despair. It's, I, I realize it's a very tough, uh, tough ride this afternoon. So we we are now going to put the control uh, ingredients into the uh, into this continuous time stochastic differential uh, formalism. So we have now a dynamics which also depends explicitly on some control variable, and we have noise. And the noise can also depend on the control and on the state, can be very, very complex. Uh, and now we have a cost that is uh, expectation value, as we've seen before, of an end cost. 
uh, and uh, a path cost, which, uh, which also depends on the control and on the state. And this expectation value is over, uh, over all uh, trajectories that start at the, at the current position uh, x, the x position, and that, uh, that have also a control function in them, right? So you should appreciate that the dependence on the control is not only here in this dependence on the cost, but actually also in the expectation value, because the expectation value is with respect to all the trajectories, and the trajectories depend on the control. If I steer this way, I get a different expectation value if I steer that way, right? So, that's, um, so that, is, uh, that is the cost that we have. And so we, now we want to optimize this C with respect to all the set of functions. And so, uh, and here it is. So it's, it's very similar to what we have already seen. So if you just bear with me for this, uh, for this uh, little uh, last thing, then uh, 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 this, this will well be op to have it happy. So we have the, the cost to go was the minimum, was like the same old Bellman equation that we got from the first slide in the discrete time case. And we have this expectation value. And so now uh, we can write this j xt plus dt and x plus dx, that we can write it in the, in the Taylor expansion. So we write it as j at the current t and x, and delta t times uh, the, the differential in uh, t, and the delta x and differential in x, and here the new thing comes. We say delta x squared and the second derivative in x. And the reason why we have to do that is it becomes clear immediately, because now we have to take the expectation value of this thing. Expectation value of, of this thing gives uh, just j, Expectation value of this thing just gives us uh, this thing because it doesn't depend on any stochastic variable. Expectation value of this thing gives us FDT, right, because it's the expectation value of this just gives the first term because this one has expectation zero. So this gives us FDT. And this one is the expectation value of, of dx squared. And dx squared... So we have dx t is f dt plus dw uh, t, so we get dx t squared is f uh, dt plus dw t squared, and so if we take uh, the expect, if we take uh, if we take this out, we take, get f squared dt squared plus uh, dw t two dw t f dt plus dw t squared. Now, this one is higher order in uh, dt, so we can ignore them because we only keep the lowest order in dt, so we can, can get rid of this. And this one has, if we take the expectation value, this one also has expectation value zero. So, but this one is actually not zero because we have that the expectation value of dw t squared was nu dt. It's linear in uh, first order in dt. So that's why we have to take the second derivative residue x because it will pick up a term proportional to dt. And that's the whole difference that we have from the situation before. So in other words, if we, rep if we put this in here, we can do the same thing that we do before, that the j cancels the j, the d, the, the, the everything, the rest, all becomes proportional to dt. We can divide by dt. We can take the, 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 the delta t j, we can take to the other side, and we're left with a minimization of u, and this is everything that is, uh, is left now here in this equation. So this is the the master, uh, grand master uh, result of uh, stochastic optimal control. So we have now, we see that we have the same that we had before in the case that the noise is zero, if nu is zero, this term is absent, and we reduce to the previous case that we had before. Uh, now we have this extra term, and we have to solve this equation. Now, um, as, as was already remarked, how do you solve this? In general, this is very, very hard to solve. So the rest of the, of the lectures, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about two classes for, uh, for today. I'm going to talk a little bit about linear quadratic control. So if you, uh, for linear quadratic control, you can <coughs> make an ansatz for, uh, for, this, for, the, for the J and actually solve, uh, solve this uh, Bellman equation. And this, the solution is known as the Riccati equations. And that is, uh, that is very well known and well studied. And we're going to look at that. And the other case is the path integral control case, in which we make a certain uh, assumption for our dynamics, which we'll, we'll cover tomorrow, in which case we can also make progress. But for today, let's look at the uh, linear quadratic uh, control case. So if the dynamics is linear, that means that dx is linear in x and linear in u, and the noise is also linear in x and linear in u, uh, and the noise is, uh, is white, 
And if the cost function is quadratic, that the end cost is quadratic and the path cost is quadratic in x and in u, and uh, in that case, uh, the, the optimal control, uh, control is uh, optimal cost to go is, is quadratic in x. So we can make a postulate of that the optimal cost to go is quadratic in x, in a linear term and a constant term. And then uh, we can fill this, uh, this in into this uh, equation and solve uh, for it. And instead of getting, since we make a explicit uh, space dependence for the j, we're only left with time dependence, and this gives rise to ordinary differential equation for these coefficients, say p of t, alpha of t, and beta of t, in terms of the parameters that we have in the, in the model. And the result of it is this. So here you see three equations, the, the time derivative of p, which is a matrix, right? This is a matrix uh, the, between states, so it's a matrix uh, evolution equation. This is alpha, this is beta, so these are the three equations, and these things are just definitions that enter here uh, to, uh, to make this a little bit more uh, co concise. And so this is just ordinary differential equations, and you can solve these. Uh, and it's not particularly useful to look at uh, this uh, in general, but let's look at some simple examples. So for instance, in the case that, um, that the dynamics is of this form, and we have uh, noise, and we have uh, the same problem as before, where we wanted to steer towards the origin, but now we have a noisy uh, system. So this is our end cost. This is our path cost. So this will apply that, these, uh, that, uh, that the phi is the, is the end cost. So uh, uh, the path cost is, is this. And so all these constants here that you have here, uh, like, uh, like these a, b, and c, and d, they have certain values. And everything becomes uh, very simple. So the Riccati equations, in this case, reduce to these three equations. You get that p dot uh, is, uh, is p squared. And the end condition is, uh, is is g because that is basically the end cost was this thing uh, has to be equal to uh, the p. So this, this p is also the thing that's the quadratic term in j, right? It's the quadratic term here in j. So that j has to be equal to phi. That means that p has to be equal to g at the end cost. So that's this term. The alpha is the linear is the linear term in the control uh, in the cost to go, which has is zero. So this has a boundary condition zero, and beta also has a, has a sum equation. And the uh, <clears throat> so you see that since alpha is zero at the end time, and it's multiplying the derivative, you see that the solution is at alpha zero for all times. That gives the solution here, and so we can solve this one. Uh, very easily that p of t is uh, 1 over c minus t. This is the solution of that equation. And the, the, the constant is equal to, uh, it's given by this equation, this gives a boundary value. And the beta is not relevant, again, because of the same reason that it affects the optimal cost to go, but not its derivative, which is the control. And so the control is just minus p minus alpha, alpha is 0, and so it's just minus p, and we solve it, we get this solution. And here again, we see the same solution that we had before in the noiseless uh, case that you get steering towards the origin with the gain factor which decreases with uh, 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 which increases with uh, with time with with time so um, interestingly if you so so the control figure is now here so we start we start uh, here and we we want to go here and so um, typically, this controller will, the diffusion will get passed like here, and so, and then at, asymptotically at end time, you want to be at the origin. You may not want to be completely at the origin, right, because there is a cost here involved. There's a cost involved for getting to the, there's a benefit of being in the origin, but there's also a cost that you pay for steering, right? And so there's a trade off. So depending on, on the size of G, this, this end thing may be wider uh, or not, uh, not wide, right? So this is, uh, depends on how much you value this term versus, uh, versus that term. But anyway, so this is the overall picture. That is your diffusion that at first is, is expanding because your control is actually, your control is not very strong, but you control at, at later time, your control gets stronger and pushes the thing to the, to the origin. Now, a particular interesting uh, limit of this, of this is when you take uh, g to, to infinity, so then the, the cost of being not in the origin becomes infinitely large, and then this control law uh, just becomes, uh, becomes simply uh, this, uh, this law here. 
And so now you see that you do really go from the origin. You go there and you go to the origin. And this problem is known as the, as the Brownian bridge problem. It's a, it's a well-known diffusion uh, problem. And you, can, you see that this Brownian bridge, where the solution depends not only on the initial state, but also on the end state, if you formulate it in a normal way, can be formulated as a control problem, where uh, actually there is a controller that makes this just a simple uh, uh, Markov process. So, OK, let's, let me step back a bit. So one way to think of this Brownian bridge is say, I, sorry, the Brownian bridge formulation is say, I started the initial condition at the zero, and I want to have a process that, that ends up also at the end time at zero. So you take information from the future and from the past to compute where your solution should be, right? So this doesn't look like a causal uh, time progressive kind of a thing that you can solve it in this way. So you need information about the future. Now, what, con what the control theory is actually doing for you, think again of this anticipated potential, it takes this information from the future, it transfers it to the current time, and it tells you what control to use at the current time. And then in that language, you can just use a first-order Markov process, a four, purely, purely forward process, this process that's here on the slides. Just say, okay, wherever you are, just move with this control, and uh, everything will be happy. Everything will be fine. You will end up with probability one in the origin, and, and that. So, so it, it's taking this two-time thing and makes it into a causal Markov, uh, Markov uh, uh, structure. Okay, that's uh, that. Any questions on that? Oh, we're, we're almost out of time. So. Uh, here's another example. Let me just do this example. And then I think we'll uh, stop. So here, um, so here you, s so, okay. In this example, you saw that, that there was an end cost and, and you saw that the control was increasing with time, right? It was getting more and more urgent to get to the end cost. Here you see, uh, here you see another example. So here we have a, a, a same dynamics, but now the, now the control cost is a path cost, so it's it's there at each time. So it's in this R. Uh, to, where's my where's my mouse? Right. No mouse left. Mouse. Well, no mouse. So here, this this is happening in the integral, right? So this is integrated of all time. And so you get this cost. Now, if you now do the Riccati equation, you get these equations, doesn't matter, and you find that the optimal control is, uh, is of this form, uh, and you can solve it, and you get um, a solution which looks like this. So the optimal, the gain now of the control, the thing that's multiplying x, uh, so you get a feedback controller that is uh, initial, has a, a, for initial times, so the time horizon is 10 here, and the initial, the, the value is constant, and then, uh, then at the end, it's, uh, the gain is getting smaller. So maybe you can think about why, why this is getting smaller. Why, uh, why, is, uh, why is this happening? Can you think about that? Who understands why this is gain is getting smaller? So you want to get at the origin, uh, but after some time you say, well, I don't care anymore. Nobody? So it's the path cost, right? So, so we have this interval from 0 to t, right? And uh, if we are at some, uh, some time here, then uh, I'm at some state, and at each state, the controller has to decide, shall I steer towards the origin, which is going to cost me u squared, uh, and I have to trade that off, what I can gain with that, and what I can gain with that is how far, how close I'm going to get in the future towards the origin, because that's one of what's my path cost. I'm going to gain that. Now, if I have a long time in front of me, I should I should steer at a certain amount, right? And that's what I do all the time in the initial time. But at some time at the end, it doesn't really benefit anymore to steer towards the origin because the expected future that I'm going to get out of that uh, out of that control solution is not going to is going not going to pay off. Not more worth my while. So in the particular, if you're at the end thing, there's nothing to, to gain anymore. There's no, there's no. So that's why, this, why it's optimal to stop steering when you get to the, to the end uh, time if you have this path cost, right? in, unlike this other case. OK, so we had, um, uh, so in this last example, the optimal control is independent of the noise. 
So you see that here, right? This, uh, this control solution is proportional to P, and there's no noise, the noise doesn't appear in here. And this is, again, a feature of this, uh, of this uh, certainty equivalence that the optimal control doesn't depend on the noise for linear quadratic control problems. These are linear quadratic control problems. And in general, for this kind of systems, these kind of equations, this is true when these uh, C and D variables are, uh, are zero, then you get uh, this, this certainty equivalence. And if not, not. Um, okay, so that's what I wanted to say today. So um, it's been a bit of a rough ride, I, uh, I, I realize. Uh, but uh, the upshot is that in uh, one and a half hour, you've learned everything about classical control theory that you uh, may have wanted to know. Uh, so, uh, so, so the, 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 st the story is that control leads to a Bellman equation. Bellman equation is very hard to solve. It's partial differential equation. Uh, you can solve it for the linear quadratic case because it yields the Riccati equation. So then it's just a polynomial, right? So if you have an n-dimensional system, you have these Riccati equations, which are matrix equations of n by n matrices. So this is all fine. You can just uh, get a thousand-dimensional system, easily do that. Um, as soon as you get out of this class of linear quadratic control problems, things with, with the, if there is no noise, you can still do this PMP formalism. But that's, uh, so that gives these ordinary differential equations with these mixed boundary, boundary problems. You can do that uh, in the noiseless case. But in the noisy case, for the nonlinear case, there's really uh, no, nothing out there except for these path integral methods. And, uh, and so uh, that we're going to study next uh, tomorrow where the solution, actually, the J that we've been seeing here so much is discussed to go, the solution of the, the, of the, of the Bellman equation. This J, we're going to now find an uh, explicit form of it. We're going to say this J is, and it's going to be a path integral. And that is the, that is the trick that we're going to use, and then we're going to compute that path integral and, and going to do some applications uh, with that. So, with no further ado, uh, see you tomorrow. <laughs>